The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Um, welcome to the second webinar from the series um, held by the Future Earth Transformations Knowledge Action Network. Um, and you're very, very welcome. And, and we're looking forward to hearing from you um, and hearing your questions. My name is Rebecca Oliver, and I'm at the Swedish hub of Future Earth, and um, I'm responsible for the uh, Transformations Knowledge Action Network. Um, the way this program will work is I'll say a couple of words right at the beginning about Future Earth, and then we'll have two presentations as uh, announced in the program. And after that, um, we'll have an open floor for questions from all of you write your questions in the um, that you should see on the right hand side of the webinar program that you can type in your questions there and um, we can try to get a, a lively conversation going so I'll start by saying just a couple of words about Future Earth um, so Future Earth is a global platform for uh, mobilizing the research community and, and practitioners around global sustainability. We are um, doing our best to, as you can see in this picture, join um, and join together communities from um, all around the world to, uh, to work together. Um, by joining us, you'll become part of an international, um, very diverse community committed to transformation and um, you'll have the opportunity to get to know about and share and meet and talk about international conferences. Um, our aim is to stimulate co-designed um, research, co-designed between different uh, sectors, um, and um, we have a, uh, a route into international policy processes and a strong uh, media and communications uh, um, and capacity building functions which um, our aim is to make these available to the community. Now we've just launched the tool which we're hoping will really make all of this happen. Um, it's the open network. This is a screen grab from our web from our website so you can see here if you if you click on this and go into the open network, this is what the front page looks like um, showing threads of discussions. you can see here I've already uploaded the questions that came in from the participants from this morning's uh, webinar. You create account, an account up here. It's a little bit hidden. We're going to see if we can make it more um, obvious. So if you go into the Open Network, sign up there. And the conversations that we don't manage to have on the webinar today, we'll be able to carry on and have those discussions on the Open Network afterwards. So the aim of the Open Network is to really just make it possible for the conversations to continue and for projects, and activities, and ideas to emerge. So I'm now going to hand the word over to Per Olsson, the first of our presentations from the Stockholm Resilience Center. And Per will be followed by Albert Nordström, who is uh, managing one of the Future Earth um, core, global core projects. And he'll tell us a bit more about that. So Per, yes, I'll stop Hello. there and um, hand the word to you. Thank you, Rebecca. So I'm Per Olsson at Stockholm Resilience Center. I'm a researcher uh, there and also a, a leader for the stream on, on the transformations in social ecological systems. So hi everyone, it's uh, nice to see you there uh, in the list of attendees. Um, uh, I uh, uh, want to start talking a little bit about generally what we're looking at uh, when it comes to transformations uh, uh, at the center. So, uh, and then Albert will talk more specifically about uh, one of the projects that we're, that we're doing. So, I'm going to start and just saying that uh, um, I like to talk about the, that we study um, these transformation to sustainability through the lens of resilient thinking and social ecological systems perspective. And yes, there's several lenses through which you can you can study transformations to sustainability. 
Um, and these are all complementary and all relevant for understanding these processes. And I just want to say that that we use this specific lens, but lens that uh, I want to avoid that discussion on what's the right framework and what's the right uh, theories to use. I think we're all complementary. Um, and uh, uh, so, what do we mean by by uh, transformations uh, to sustainability from our perspective? Well, we we are interested in large scale transformations, and and uh, there are uh, other studies that have addressed such similar transformations, and uh, which which uh, I get very inspired by reading about and and learn a lot from, which could, for example, be the, the transformation from a planned economy to market economy, in the industrialization process, um, the moving from uh, a conflict situation, a war situation, to a peace and democracy is also very interesting um, from a transformation point of view. And our background is also in, in uh, systems thinking and complexity, and we're interested in how different initiatives and solutions are contributing to this whole system change, like in this case, the food system. system. And when you look at that, you know, it's like, where do you start and how can you even start changing something like that? Um, a key aspect in our research is uh, the focus on social ecological systems and we use a, a, a human in nature perspective where we view humans as ultimately dependent on healthy uh, ecosystems and we a lot of a lot of the transformation processes that are ongoing in the world for example the green revolution Africa low carbon development and, and farming the sea are Look, all the good intention to provide food and energy and other things, but they may have negative effects on both the planet, people, and planet. So, uh, this perspective on on uh, how do we um, how do we achieve uh, these kind of changes at the same time as we take good care of our planet is a key aspect of our research, and we need these kind of thinking about how to navigate this space that some people refer to as the safe and just space. And I think the planetary boundaries and the, and the, the Oxfam donut that you see in the picture here can help us do that. It helps us think about how we navigate uh, these transformative processes so they, we don't end up uh, crossing either planetary boundaries or social boundaries. And this picture is from Lee Chetal, Lee Chetal at, uh, from the World Social Science Report. Um, so I'm going to talk about three aspects uh, that we are interested in when we address these kind of um, uh, transformations in a social ecological uh, context. And I will. I also want to. I think push some of the transformations to sustainability community and this new field that is emerging. That sometimes these these uh, transformations or or the definition of transformation to sustainability says that it's about societal transformation to deal with environmental change. But I think that it misses the social ecolo ecological linkages a bit because. Um, large-scale societal transformations in, in the context of environmental change won't automatically help us embark on sustainability uh, trajectories if, the, if those transformations does not improve people-planet relationships. So that's the, that's the sort of where, where we come from when we address these things. And one of the challenges I feel like is, is how do we how do we increase people's well-being at the same time as we we uh, increase the capacity of ecosystems to generate services that we are ultimately depending on? And I think we have been pretty good historically at at, at improving people's lives uh, in many parts of the world, but at the expense of uh, of of uh, the planet. And 
the more the closer we get to the planet's different tipping points, uh, the more important it is to do both at the same time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about first about transformations. I'm going to talk about three things, transformations, innovation, scaling, and, and agency. Uh, and when it comes to uh, transformations, we use resilience thinking and panicky theory, theory, but there is also other theories and frameworks that we draw on, and including pathways that approach the, the transition management, uh, you have uh, social innovation, social movements, um, and, uh, and um, others that we use in combination with the resilience thinking. I think they have a couple of things in common, and they address cross-scale interactions, for example, and multiple scales, multiple phases of transformations, uh, trajectories, uh, and so on. So there is a, they have a lot in common. So we do collaborate uh, a lot with people from, for example, Steps and Center and in the UK and, and Drift in the Netherlands and, and um, uh, Social Innovation and Resilience Institute in Waterloo, Canada. So one thing uh, that we use uh, when we talk about transformation is the cup and ball metaphor. So there's we can say talk about two different systems represented by the two basins in this figure, uh, and it might be hard to move from one to the other. And here it's represented by the you know the the ball getting pushed, uh, and um, there are self there might be self reinforcing feedbacks that keeps you in a certain state. There is uh, people talk about inertia, and barriers, and traps and lockings that makes it hard to move from one. Uh, basing to the other. Uh, so there might be, as we show here, th thresholds in between them. Um, but there are also uh, leverage points and tipping points and you might have moments in time when large scale changes are possible after a long period of rigidity uh, and that provides a window of opportunity to change. So although each uh, transformation is context specific, we think that there are some general patterns such as multiple faces um, uh, where in this picture you see that beneath that uh, figure there there is um, uh, uh, three faces, preparing the system for change, navigating the, the transition and stabilizing. Um, preparing the system is uh, is about this sort of unlocking and and, and uh, maybe reducing uh, the resilience of the undesired state. And, uh, and navigating is when you have a window of opportunity and you have the opportunity to move and you need to navigate that threshold. And then, and then in the last phase you need to stabilize and, and build resilience of that new uh, basin. So the way we think about this and the way we use this is, for example, in Chile we use this thinking to guide our studies of the shift from an open access management approach that had negative consequences for ecosystems and people um, uh, to a more sort of polycentric integrated approach that uh, resulted in a new social ecological interactions and feedbacks and that was more desirable and benefited people and uh, ecosystems. So in this case, you can see the, the, um, the sort of reaction to the system that didn't work resulted in, in a lot of, in a couple, in not too many, but three experimentation places in, in Chile along the coast. And, and, it, uh, and it was part of this preparation phase where they start to uh, experiment with new social ecological configuration and these were this was made by uh, together with scientists and, and fishermen and trying to come up with a new approach uh, than, than the one that was so destructive and then it started to link people together and building maybe what you call uh, from a management transition management theory a, a niche or the proto regime uh, they start to generate new knowledge 
and then uh, in uh, at the late in the late 80s after uh, after the Pinochet regime the new government was interested in, in creating a new fishery policy and uh, and uh, the knowledge that was generated in the experiments were navigated into that process and and then the the knowledge was uh, negotiated and, and incorporated in the new uh, policy and that was part of what we call the navigation phase uh, and in 1997 uh, there was a new fishery policy and a new regulation new new institutions and then uh, they went into this what we call the stabilizing phase when it's about to making that a uh, new uh, approach uh, and institution stick uh, and build resilience of the new trajectory. So that's how we kind of think about it and how we use it in our, uh, in, our, in our work. So then I want to talk about uh, innovation and scaling. And uh, when it comes to innovation, uh, there's a lot of talk now about like we need more and more innovation, but it's not like we haven't been uh, innovative before. And it's actually the the uh, our great innov innovation capacity that have put us in this precarious situation globally uh, through the great acceleration and into what some people refer them to as the Anthropocene. But, so, but we need to be smarter on how we innovate. And there are lots of good things out there, but we have a concern that, um, that the, the, sort of the technological and social innovation that are, uh, that are pushed now in the name of sustainability aren't really improving or changing the human environmental interactions. So we really need to um, ways of, of addressing that and, and deal with that. And one of the problem with the with another problem maybe with the with the with the um, uh, innovation that are pushed today is, is is illustrated by this figure, which is a a, a bed for for homeless uh, people and li people living on the street. It's an innovation that uh, can say improve the life uh, for the people living on the street, but it doesn't really uh, change the systemic problem of, of having homeless people. So I think uh, we need to um, think more about how uh, innovations can have a systemic impact. So that's why we developed this social ecological innovations uh, concept. Um, that uh, uh, that builds actually on on this uh, social innovation definition that uh, Francis Wesley and other have developed in, in at the University of Waterloo, because I think this is uh, capture the essence of what we need, uh, which is a view uh, that says that we need to change the systems dynamics that created the problem in the first place, and then. Uh, so the definition there, uh, where we put in social ecological systems instead of just social systems, um, is really um, a way of uh, addressing how can an innovation have systemic impacts, and it's uh, how can innovation be disruptive, and uh, how can innovation challenge and, and change the roles and routines, the power, structures, the groups, and how, how people are uh, linked in networks, etc. How does it change or challenge the resource flows, the meaning and values? And, and that's what we mean of, of an innovation having a, a, a systemic impact. But what we add to that then, and that was really specific and that we try to push from our side, is it's also about a fundamentally changing human one mental interactions and how these innovations that are pushed are doing that or not. And in the end it's about innovation that can enhance the capacity of Earth's ecosystems to generate essential services. Um, so, um, so we are, uh, we are interested in, in, um, in looking at examples of this and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Albert will talk more about this in a in a, in a bit. So, uh, so there's one thing about like identifying, analyzing these good examples around the world, and this is uh, an example called Blue Blue Ventures in in Madagascar that 
that uh, um, use new business models to uh, help local people and um, uh, have livelihoods that benefit both people and the ecosystems. Um, but another issue then that we're dealing a lot with is scaling, and uh, uh, which is also a, a, a huge challenge um, when it comes to uh, achieving uh, sustainability. So uh, uh, currently there are lots of attempts to scale uh, good things like biofuels. Biofuels is not a it's not a terrible idea uh, at the local level, but as it is scaled up uh, we, uh, into the global economy, we see huge uh, ecological and social negative consequences. So the big challenge is how do we scale things in ways that uh, continues to benefit people and planet as you, as you scale the innovation up. Um, and they're going into uh, the last uh, part of uh, what I what I'm what I'm talking about is is uh, the issue of agency. So uh, we uh, we have uh, currently a lot of focus on individuals and and maybe heroes and uh, and these agents of change that will help us achieve uh, sustainability. And we want to move away from this sort of heroes or or heropreneurs to more um, to more um, distributed agency and uh, the more focus maybe on on institutional entrepreneurs and also uh, policy entrepreneurs and uh, the uh, the thing we are uh, also addressing as part of this is also moving away from from this notion of windows of opportunity that you only have like one shot and and uh, and uh, to act and really look at opportunity context uh, and how how agents of change navigate different opportunity context as part of of these transformation processes so that's also a, a big part of our research. And just to show you how we apply this kind of thinking that I've been talking about, the transformation, the, the innovation, the scaling and agency in one case, I just want to show you one, uh, one example um, uh, from our research. And this is an example from uh, the Coral Triangle Initiative in Southeast Asia and Western Pacific, where six countries have gone together and, uh, and uh, uh, created um, uh, a governance regime uh, for managing a very large scale area. The six countries, uh, uh, yeah, six countries uh, that has uh, been part of this multilateral process of regime formation uh, to, to uh, improve ecosystem management. So the, what we are interested in here is, is how, what was the sequence of events that led up to, to uh, this new governance structure. And we, we're interested in what, what is the idea, what is the innovation. In this case, it was ecosystem-based management, an idea that has um, been developed in, and tested at the local level, but also in bilateral uh, context. And how this uh, idea was carried by uh, change makers and, and uh, these kind of institutional entrepreneurs in order to gain momentum uh, to, uh, to create the new governance structure. So you, what, we, what we look at here is sort of the scale spanning activities of these institutional entrepreneurs moving between the national, regional and global scales. But also we, see, we look at how they move this idea through different phases. So I just want to show you that as an example of how we how we how we work uh, and how we uh, apply this thinking <coughs> to our uh, research. So I'm uh, I'm going to stop there and uh, leave it to Albert. Thank you, Per. Um, yes, we'll take questions um, after Albert. So. Um, 
how that you need to put your presentation on full screen. So, um, yeah, I can't see any questions in the question uh, box just yet, but do um, don't hesitate to write them down as you as you think of them. Albert. All right, thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Pat. Hope uh, folks can hear me. There was some issue of audio feedback in the morning session, but hopefully it's been resolved now. And uh, if people are getting some static or feedback, just um, mention it in the questions in the chat, and I'll try and change my uh, my mic or something like that. It sounds um, fine. So it sounds fine. Great. Okay. So um, I'll spend about ten minutes just describing this project called Seeds of a Good Anthropocene which really has a lot to do with transformations and builds a lot upon, upon the ideas and the frameworks that Pal just talked about. Um, I have some contact details there, um, so if you have any, any questions you don't want to flag or raise at this webinar, just don't hesitate to, to shoot me an email afterwards and I'll try and answer them uh, when I get the chance. Okay, let me just see if I can get this slideshow moving. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the underlying idea behind um, or the rationale behind this project is that um, visions of the future shape people's decisions and actions and when it comes to thinking around the Anthropocene it's often images like this that pop into people's mind. It's humanity as some form of parasitic entity that's just eating away at the, at the biosphere and will finally you know, um, destroy everything on this planet. And so we're constantly bombarded with negative visions of the future, um, which may inhibit our ability to move towards a positive future for the Earth and humanity. Um, like we all know, there's a, no lack of stories documenting climate change or biodiversity loss, inequality, and other examples of unsustainable development around the world. And as scientists in particular are drawn to problems. We like to describe problems and we like to solve problems. And so science often focuses on describing and understanding problems, but this can leave society uninspired with little sense of potential solutions and with no blueprint for the transformations required to solve some of these truly big and important big challenges we're facing in the Anthropocene, right? So um, a group of scientists um, within this project, brought, we're a kind of broad crew of people, from researchers from Canada, from South Africa, the US, the UK, the Netherlands, Brazil, Germany, and China. Our aim is to kind of envision what better futures could actually look like and try and expand the range and diversity of these positive visions. So basically start exploring this concept of a good Anthropocene. Can we even talk about, you know, welcome to the fabulous Anthropocene era, right? Um, and it's, it's a future Earth funded project um, that involves um, a bunch of of the Future Earth core global projects such as PECS and Eco Services and GLP and ESG. And I think it's a nice example also of a practical example of this is what Future Earth can actually do um, what, in the sense of bringing together core projects and try and target this really complicated and difficult um, challenging research frontiers, right? And so basically what we're trying to do in the project is to, like I said, solicit, explore, and develop a suite of alternative plausible visions of a good Anthropocene. Um, and we're trying to do this by identifying and analyzing bright spots um, or seeds, real space, real places on the world that demonstrate one or more elements of a positive future that might serve as seeds of a good Anthropocene. And very quickly just define a seed, well, it's a way of thinking or doing, it's an institution, a piece of technology, a business, a project or an organization that exists today. So it can't just be like the figment of someone's imagination. It has to exist at least in prototype form and it has to be marginal. We're interested not in the kind of first horizon or the dominant things happening even though there's a lot of promising dominant technologies and organizations out there. We're interested in the ones that are still a bit in the margins, okay? And these things, these seeds, need to be contributing to creating a sustainable future, at least according to someone. And so I'll give some examples of seeds that we've been collecting and that exist in our database. And these examples I'm going to give now are in no way an indication of which seeds we believe are the best ones and so on. They're just there for me to highlight the diversity of things that people have been sending in and that we've been collecting. So. 
One of these examples is a Tree for Life um, initiative, which focuses on rewilding Scottish uh, rainforests, um, in the Scottish Caledonian rainforests, and tries to restore the wilderness to ecosystems and the human spirits. And doing this requires this initiative to work in changing how people view what is natural and possible in Scottish nature. And so the project works extensively with volunteers to uh, combine landscape transformation with education. And so basically what they're doing is planting trees, educating people, restoring ecosystems, reintroducing predators, and trying to kind of, in essence, reconnect people back to nature. Another seed indicative of quite a lot of these seeds we've been collecting is this one, which really differs to the previous one. This is the Songdo Smart City. It's a newly built smart city in, uh, near Seoul in South Korea. And um, this place was planned to be a place to attract a little bunch of corporate headquarters and um, you know, attract a lot of businesses and international big corporations um, with this very green rebuilt area on the reallocated land next to the airport. The strange thing with this initiative is that it didn't really succeed in attracting a lot of these businesses. Instead, a lot of Korean families saw this as a really nice place to move into and live in because of the green infrastructure and the huge effort made when designing this space and creating green spaces and um, sustainable thinking in the design of the buildings. So instead of attracting businesses, a lot of families moved in there. And it's actually now transforming into quite a vibrant and good example of new ways of designing urban areas in ways that are both social and ecological sustainable. So it's, it has an interesting story to it. And the third example is indicative also of another cluster of seeds um, dealing with you know, more social ecological approaches to um, generating food security, biodiversity conservation, and to some extent education as well. So Green Matter is an initiative in South Africa. It's aimed at driving transformations in graduate level skills linked to biodiversity conservation in the region in South Africa, right? So the background to this seed is that in 2010, the South African Governance Economic Cluster convened the first Green Economy Summit with the aim to map out a green growth pathway that you know, both creates jobs while reducing pollution and uses South Africa's natural resources wisely. And so in this convention, in this movement, there was an increasing recognition then that economic growth cannot be attained at the expense of ecosystems. So to deliver on these policies coming out of this um, initiative, South Africa in, you know, identified that we need biodiversity skills. However, like historically in this region, skills in this area were rare and excluded the majority of the population. So um, the biodiversity human capital development strategy was advanced to the, support the growth of a robust green economy. And w within this policy, you had things like Green Matter popping up, which is a project that engages different sectors that tries to bring together networks or organizations, peoples and institutions that try to implement solutions that address both challenges around you know, biodiversity, economic growth and food security. So it's kind of a knowledge exchange organization in South Africa. So that's kind of giving you an idea of the diversity and types of seeds we've been collecting. And so very briefly, the objectives of us collecting these seeds, like I said before, is to you know explore and and um, um, and you know probe this concept of a good Anthropocene. We also want to analyze these seeds. Um, data that we're collecting on each seed includes things like its location, the pathway of impact, its global relevance. What are some of the challenges it's addressing? What are some of the enhancing factors and the actors involved? How many people are involved? What's the current state of the seed? So we're trying to analyze the seeds and also look at the values and assumptions underlying these seeds and so on. Um, and like I said before, we want to stimulate a reflection about different positive and regional global futures. And part of our project is also through working through the different workshops we've been organizing in different parts of the world. We're trying to foster regional networks of change agents in different sub-projects linked to the research which is ongoing um, to the different projects linked to the Seeds of a Good Anthropocene project. I'll just mention that in a couple of slides later on. So this is like the, the usual suspects, just a small subset of the people involved in some of the workshops we've had. We met the core group once in uh, snowy and cold Stockholm in 2015 and then once in sunny and much warmer Stellenbosch in November 2015. Um, and like I said, one of the key 
you know, outcomes of this is this big seed database. So currently we have around 500 seeds and the photos I just showed before that just gives you an indication of how we've been collecting these seeds. We've been doing it through an online platform. We've also been doing it by having multiple sessions and conferences and multiple workshops in different parts of the world. So we've collected around 500 seeds. Um, and what we're trying to do them again is to describe, get a sense of what types of seeds are in there. We're trying to use these seeds to enhance and improve participatory scenario methods. And we're also going to analyze these seeds to try and understand their transformative potential. So what does all this mean? I mentioned a bit about, you know, that we're, when we're collecting seeds and when people are submitting seeds to us, we're collecting a lot of information on attributes and characteristics. So that allows us to cluster the seeds, get a sense of what types of systems they're acting in, um, what's their focal point, what's the key challenges they're addressing, and so on and so on. So that's giving us a good idea of also what people are thinking of when they're thinking in terms of initiatives that can support a good anthropocene, which is quite an important um, research question. We're also trying to feed into this newly emerging um, way of doing scenarios, like participatory scenarios, basically are a set of powerful tools that can be used not only to explore, identify, and analyze alternative futures, but also address uncertainties um, in the future trajectories of systems. Okay? So by incorporating seeds into participatory approaches, we think it's, like it's an effective way to conduct these inductive participatory scenario developments. Um, so hopefully we can, you know, because of the seeds themselves are quite dis diverse, the scenarios created from merging them into these participatory scenario approaches can give us a good representation of the diverse views of what a good anthropocene might actually mean, right? And another approach of incorporating seeds into scenario methods is to explore how a group of initially disconnected seeds could together provide new opportunities under a common set of anthropocene challenges. All of this sounds quite technical, but what it does is that in the past, a lot of scenario exercises that the IPCC and now the IPBS are using are really based on status quo and just like um, for just um, extending trajectories of what's been happening in the past. And they're quite bad at incorporating the diversity of things happening in local and regional contexts. And we're hoping by using these seeds and by developing these methods, future scenario um, exercises will be much more open and much more diverse um, in the kinds of stories they generate. And finally, the kind of third major um, fork of how we're kind of using the seeds is we're having a bunch of postdocs here at the Stockholm Resilience Center now that will be looking by applying the frameworks that Pat has been talking about, trying to understand what the transformative potential of these seeds could be, how some of these seeds can grow, what's the potential of some of these seeds to scale up and be replicated, how some of these seeds can change values across different places around the world and so on. So that's going to be an interesting exercise in getting a sense of how transformative can these seeds actually be. And like I said, we've been collecting these seeds in many different forum and many different contexts. Um, one way of making it more accessible to the public is we've generated this online web um, website where we're um, collecting and writing about these seeds a bit more in detail. So the whole database includes 500 seeds. The online website has 120 of them in a nice short blog form so you can just surf it and read up on some of these seeds and get inspired. And it, also if you have seeds yourself you want to contribute to, um, you want to contribute us with, you can just do it through this online um, website here. And so the address of it is um, just shown below. Um, and just very quickly, in these ideas of that we're also trying to engage with in different regions, again linking to the different projects of researchers and engage in this in this uh, Seeds of the Good Anthropocene project. When we're doing these different conferences and workshops, we're also trying to engage in these policy dialogues with change makers in different regions. And together with these um, policy makers and relevant stakeholders, like for example, this is from one of these policy dialogues we held in South Africa where we convened researchers, policy makers and stakeholders um, working in the region. Together with these people explore notions of a good Anthropocene and what kind of transformations do these people believe are required to change their region and what kind of seeds they see in their region. So it's one way of kind of connecting to people that we believe can actually have an important role in transforming the system um, in that place and engaging with them 
around ideas of a good Anthropocene and seeds of a good Anthropocene. And of course, there's been a kind of scientific output as well, which is important for us researchers. It's a paper that just came out um, a few weeks ago in Frontiers that just describes the initial steps of this, uh, this project. Um, and then in the pipeline, several other papers coming out focusing on different aspects of this, of this project. So hopefully they'll be coming out in the next few months or year or so. Um, and that's it. I'm not going to talk much more. Hopefully some of your questions, um, or hopefully this has stimulated some thinking among yourselves. If you have questions that you want, you don't have time to ask here, just send me an, an email. This is just some contact information about the project. You can go on the website and submit your seed or just read a bit more about it or follow us on social media. And uh, hopefully we'll connect um, at some point in the future. So I guess I'll leave it over to you now, Rebecca. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Um, looking at the questions at the moment, there's one for um, Per and one for Albert. Um, I think Per's had a few minutes to think about his questions, so while Albert's taking a look at his, I'll give the word over to Per. And please do um, send in your questions. I think that would be um, it. Would be great. We have about uh, 15 minutes to. Um, to find out more according to your questions from uh, Per and Albert. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, it sounds fine, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, do people see the question or sh should I read it? I think you have to read it on this system. Yeah. So, Susie Moser, thank you very much for your question. It says, the change process described does not really look like a transformative change to me, just more like adjusting existing systems, not fundamentally change them. Maybe I missed that, but can you articulate how the case you described last is a true transformation? What is a transformation? I guess the broader question for me that emerges is how, to, how do we guard against an in, inflationary use of the idea of transformation? Um, is every, uh, every getting off the couch a transformation? Just to be provocative, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, uh, good, good question. And, and uh, the last case there with the, with the Coral Triangle Initiative is not a uh, true transformation. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't uh, make that clear. But uh, actually, it's a way where we just uh, look at ha how an idea um, goes from being uh, sort of, or how it's used to build a new uh, governance regime. And, uh, and the idea there was the ecosystem-based management. So what we're doing is we're trying to apply our social ecological um, uh, innovation framework and, and uh, uh, our ideas around scaling and to to see how how that um, how that idea is, is uh, scaled up, so it's not and it and it isn't a transformation. But it's interesting that uh, that you ask that question because it's those international uh, international agreements and institutions are of course uh, important could be important for transformations at other level, at national and local level. So we, we have looked a little bit uh, up, uh, on that, is, is how, um, how that affects uh, uh, processes on, on the ground. And um, I think I agree with you that, uh, uh, in general, that a lot of things uh, is called a transformation, which is not really for us. When we look at transformative processes, really, we're really trying to develop this feedback mapping approach, where we try to uh, to look at how is the social and ecological components uh, linked differently uh, uh, in a change process. Because the definition we use for transformation is a fundamental shift in social ecological feedback. So we try to uh, develop methods for that um, and um, to look at these kind of before and after uh, things. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. I'll, um, 
I'll give the word to, to Albert. Um, you were asked um, when you're collecting seeds, are you basically collecting what other, um, other volunteers send you or are you actively seeking them? Are you trying to be balanced or comprehensive in the types of seeds and where they originate? Country sectors, types of seeds and actors. And then a question, a loop, which I link on to that for you, Albert, is um, have you been scoping investors behind some of these projects? either to understand the investment part of the transformation, but also to see whether there are potential investors to bring the seeds to scale. Albert. Yeah, thanks for repeating that, Rebecca. The, the funny thing is I can't really see the questions, so I'll, it's good that you, someone has to read the questions out to me. I don't know, they're not just popping up in, in my questions uh, box for some reason. but. Um, so I guess the question is how we've been collecting them, if we've been actually seeking out the, the seeds. It's been, it's been very organic, actually. Um, I mean, we've been doing it also on running on like, you know, we don't have a huge machinery and a huge logistical enterprise behind us. We're just a network of researchers. So the, the initial steps is to, we, we began is by collecting seeds within our, our research networks around ourselves and then slowly our search net just got broader and broader and we began collecting seeds in conferences and workshops within our specific projects. So for example, an example is one of the PEX projects is linked with um, fishermen and uh, fisher people in, in, um, in, in Eastern Africa. And so when researchers within that project were running workshops for different reasons, we just piggybacked on that and started collecting seeds with the local stakeholders there. So that's how we've been doing this, we were trying to just piggyback as much as we can in conferences and workshops and then through the establishment of this, the website, this web portal, um, we're hoping to cast the web or our net even further out and start collecting seeds from, from the general public and just people out there. Um, and then of course there's now just doing this first analysis of the seeds of this, these first 500, there's definitely regions that are underrepresented and there's specific types of seeds which are underrepresented. I, you know, we, we really want to look at this pluralistically and collect as, as diverse a set of seeds. So we just don't want to get stuck in like just having seeds for a small scale polyculture, um, you know, green farming initiatives, even though they're extremely interesting and potentially have an important role in larger scale transformations. We want to see what the breadth of different things and happening out there that people think can contribute to good, good Anthropocene are. So even ideas from business and, uh, and, and so on, which is, could be a bit provocative, but we're really hoping to collect as broad um, uh, a collection of seeds. And hope this is an, an evolving project and as we get more people involved, we're getting more and more interest, get a bit of funding tacked on. Hopefully we can do this in a more coherent and, and strategic way, but at the time being we're just trying to expand as much as our own schedules and logistical capacities allow for, given that we're just a research network. Um, and I didn't really get the, the, the third part of the question, um, Rebecca, with the investment. Maybe just, just repeat that and I can see if I can answer it in a, in a good what, way now. Or I can, right. What, I, what I've tried to do now is to um, throw up the questions so that everybody can see them. So Albert, you should be able to see some more questions that have come in. Um, I'll repeat the question from Dave uh, Oram. Have you also been scoping the investors behind some of these projects or are you looking for potential investors to help these seeds scale? And then maybe uh, that links to a question from Craig Starger, Starger about um, do we have any evidence that scaling actually works or do we mainly have evidence that scaling doesn't work? But I, um, I'll let you decide if you want to answer now or give the word to Pear, but I've thrown the questions up, so hopefully everybody can see them now. Yeah. Oh, I still can't see them, but I'm, I'm fine and just, you know, I, I might, I'll, I'll deal with it in some way. If you just repeat if there's a specific question to me. Yeah, no, um, as for the first question, with specific investments, no, we haven't been looking at that. I mean, that's, that's an interesting idea, but I think that's just beyond the scope of what we're trying to do initially. I think we're just fully busy just to analyze the seeds um, and the huge diversity of, of, of seeds in there. So I think that's going to keep us busy um, for, for a while. Um, and as it, scaling up, I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, that's Craig Starger's uh, question. I think there is evidence 
Um, Pat gave some examples. Maybe Pat can reflect on this question after I've said my bits um, around social innovations and things like that. Those kind of transformations and transitions. There's definitely evidence of, of, of scaling up. When it comes to seeds, I think it's you know there's what we've been seeing out is there's a, there's a gradient in seeds. None of these, like I said, we're looking for seeds in the margin, so none of the seeds de facto we are collecting are going to be things that have scaled massively up. But you do see that some of these seeds have been replicated. Like, for example, the transition networks, it's, it's definitely not a major player. I mean, people from transition towns don't get invited to the G8 forum or things like that. But if you look at them, the seeds we've been collecting, they're actually an initiative that has been replicated. It's been spread to a few hundred places around the world, at least very successfully, um, and maybe even more um, in, in a kind of prototype form. And so you get the sense that potentially this is a seed that will have some kind of transformative capacity in the sense of really being scaled up to become something major. We don't know, but it's that diversity is allowing us to start looking at those elements and start um, quizzing the different seeds with regards to their scalability. But maybe, Pai, you can reflect. I mean, I think there is within different you know, streams of research dealing with transition and transformations, definitely examples of things being scaled up, especially if you go back and some of these more historical analysis of things and transitions happening in the past, I think you can actually look at examples from, from that. Pat? Thank you. Uh, uh, so, am I on? Yes. My mic is on? Yep. Uh, so yeah, this is really interesting uh, question, and and um, uh, well, there's no clear answers that I know of, but um, I think uh, I think a lot about like how things can be disruptive, uh, how ideas can be disruptive, and so on. And I, but I I agree that I feel like the scaling concept as it is used today is very limiting. It's sort of based on a sort of a market market based economic thinking, a sort of scaling as reaching more people and, and, and so on. That I think I think we have to question the whole scaling concept. And um, and I like I work a bit with uh, people at uh, Bertha Center at uh, University of Cape Town on on um, on this issue. And they uh, Warren Nelson is one of them there and uh, so one of the things that he studies is, is uh, relationships between people and how that um, is the sort of the key to change and, and uh, we I mentioned before that we're interested in in sort of how things uh, change roles and routines power relationship groups and networks resource flows and meaning and values, and that's what's happening often in these little the experiments or the seeds that I've talked about is that that new relationships are developing and affecting these kind of systems properties. So what we what I think also is then interesting is is also how how we change the relay how that can re change our relationship with with the ecosystems or with nature with the planet. And then, so scaling for me is about is is sort of having those relationships play out at a sort of larger scale. So I think we need to, and that I find that there is something there that sort of really fundamentally uh, changes or or define scaling in a different way. So we're just there. I'm just there, sort of. Uh, 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 picking at that at the moment and just starting. So I think that's a good one. Uh, there was something more here about uh, that Craig uh, Storger you asked there. Um, yeah, about about uh, uh, solutions and and uh, if they would work in one solutions that work in in one place will probably not work in another place. And and to try to do so has often resulted in a huge waste of resources. And I think I think you're right there that uh, and it's it's um, um, it's um, it's I'm critical to the sort of the best practice idea where where you can go to one place and and look at how things are done and then you you sort of boil that down to a list of sort of things um, uh, that you can just apply somewhere else and uh, I don't think that's 
I think that is a, often a waste of time. But I think there is a lot of that horizontal learning in, in the cases that we have looked at. There are like groups of, of uh, community members that, that has a problem that goes to a, another place where they have solved the problem and learn and then um, um, get some knowledge and insights and go back and uh, contextualize that knowledge into their uh, environment and, and to solve the problem. So I think that horizontal learning is an interesting uh, aspect. Should I just, should I stop there uh, or? Yeah, no, we have, some, have few... um, we have a comment that come in that I sh I've, you should be able to see now from Cheryl Lyon. Um, in my experience with transition towns, they don't want to scale up um, as or scale out because localization is a strong transition principle. Um, every ecological social community does it in its own does it in its own way. So, how does that relate to this to the idea that these transformations can spread sufficiently? I don't know. I, I presume you're, you're talking about achieving at some point, a, a tipping point that changes fundamentally the, the relationship um, and moves us away from, from the unsafe space. Mm. Mm. Am I still on? Yes. Yeah, so I think, I think, that's a, I think this raises a really interesting uh, issue and that's, does things have to, like, a, um, um, like transition town, is it? Does it have to scale up in order to make a difference? Uh, I think this is the issue. Is if if you have a lot of these localized um, examples or, or seeds, uh, and no one is interested in scaling up, can they still have a an effect on on and create patterns at at uh, different levels? I think that's an interesting issue. I think there is evidence for that. Um, but I feel I feel like this is really the cutting edge of, of where the research is right now. Thank you. Well, we are um, approaching um, the end of the of the webinar time. Um, I do think that it's um, you know some good discussions and difficult discussions have uh, have got started. Um, do go on to the Future Earth website and sign up for the open network. Um, you can see there I've uploaded um, a page which has the questions that came in uh, this morning and I'll add to that the questions that have come in today. So you'll all be able to, um, uh, to continue discussing on, um, on, that th on those threads and I'm hoping that, um, that this has been a, a useful um, event. I also think it would be nice for us to um, uh, to hear some feedback from you. Did you find this um, helpful? Did you find it an easy system to use? Um, I'm trying to work out why Albert can't see the questions, but I hope that all the rest of you um, found out where to type in questions so that we can um, make sure that these webinars are um, also a dialogue with those of you who join up. So. Um, I think with that, unless there are some more questions, we've um, been very happy to have um, over 35 participants with us today and, and, and almost 50 this morning. So um, thank you very much and do look out for, for more invitations to webinars. This is, as I said, one, um, what, one of, in a series. Um, and you can, if you sign up for the open network, you'll get the announcements and invitations through the open network. And if you don't sign, sign up, then I will send you these invitations by email. So um, we look forward to you joining us again and joining the Future Earth um, open network and the Transformations Knowledge Action Network. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much to uh, Per and to Albert. And... Um, Good evening from Stockholm and good morning or good afternoon wherever you are. Bye-bye.